All right, my dudes, I hope we're doing well today. Um, okay, so this is standing in the place of the class that I would have given today on Monday and also stands in the place of the tutorial for you guys to follow for your class exercise for the walk cycle. Now, I apologize, I'm feeling quite under the weather. That's why I'm not taking classes today. So if I sound bleak, that's the reason why. I hope that you'll be able to just follow along with the monotony of my voice. So today we're going to be taking a look at doing a basic walk cycle. Taking a look at Canvas, you'll see that I've quoted an animator that I enjoy following on YouTube, Rusty Animator, which breaks down the idea of walking simply as a natural process of falling and catching ourselves before we hit the ground. I've provided a link to a video that he's made on YouTube. I highly recommend checking it out. And it's just a breakdown of what a walk cycle consists of. Um, even though he uses a 3D character, it still applies to 2D animation as well. We still use the same poses, we still go through the same process, and it's something that I'd recommend going and taking a look at, just so that you can kind of see a better breakdown of what builds up a walk cycle. All right. Um, on the page itself, you'll see that I've provided the half walk cycle breakdown, as well as the full walk cycle breakdown. We're going to be referring to both of these today in After Effects as guides. So you can download these by simply right clicking and saying save image. Um, but I have included them in the project file. So if you extract it correctly and open it in After Effects correctly, you're not going to have a problem viewing those. You can find the rig that we'll be using over here as well as the Illustrator file in case it breaks along the way. So you can get those. And then obviously the tutorial, I'm recording that right now you will then um, be able to access that here. And I'll set up the due dates for this at a later stage. I just wasn't feeling like messing around with the Google Calendar uh, today. All right, so when we open up our file, this is what it is going to look like. We've got our character inside of After Effects. You can see that I've already been playing around with the layers, so let's just quickly make them all sort of not shy, get that back to, to the basic setup. All right, so, I'm going to be walking through a very basic way of doing a walk cycle today. And um, once we can kind of get over the hurdle of thinking about how the body moves, it becomes a lot easier to break down what it is that we're doing and then to actually um, sort of copy and paste our keyframes in such a way that makes this animation process a lot simpler to do. So I want to give a quick rundown of what we'll be doing. Um, if I go through the layers, there are a couple of layers that you won't have seen before. So I've got duplicate of um, our shades. I've got our normal sunglasses and then there's shades as well. I've got this glasses sheen. I'm going to be showing you guys how to make it look as though we've got these bands of light moving over his glasses as our character is walking at the end of the animation as part of our sort of secondary action. Um, but we won't be dealing with that up front. Um, we've got our basic character being set up as we can see here. We need to move all of our anchor points into the correct positions and we're going to then be animating position and rotation in order to animate our character and make him look as though he is walking. All right, so the very first thing that we're going to do is we're just going to deal with our layers over here. Um, let's start moving our anchor points into the correct positions and start parenting things as we need to. All right, so layer one and layer two, you'll see what we'll be doing with those um, at the end of the animation. So I'm just going to label both of these in red. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make them shy and I'm going to um, lock them or I'll, I'll lock them after I'm done parenting actually. Um, layer three is our hat. We're just going to move the anchor point to where that would come into contact with the front of our character's head. And I'm just going to label that in green, anything to do with the, the face or the head we're going to label in green. We then have our ear. The ear we can also label in green. Uh, we don't need to worry about the anchor point there because we're not going to be moving that anchor point. We then have our normal shades. So you can see that we've got a duplicate of these two layers. Um, shades and mouth, we're going to label these in green as well. And um, what we're going to do is we aren't going to be animating the shades today, but it does help just putting their anchor points in the correct position. We're actually going to move it to where it comes into contact with the ear so that if we wanted to animate it, uh, we could make it look as though it was bumping up and down, essentially. All right. And because this shade is a duplicate of these shades, we're just going to quickly parent layer 1 to layer 5. So that whatever happens to layer 5, layer 1 will follow it. And that will guarantee that we don't accidentally see these two sunglasses clipping. As I say, we're only going to get to layer 1 and 2 at the end of the animation. 
but it's good to get that done now. All right, we then have our upper and lower arms. So I'm just going to quickly solo these two over here. And a great way to see where to put your anchor point, especially when working with limbs. It can look strange if we place the, the forearm anchor point in the wrong position, and then it kind of looks as though the arm is a bit broken or disjointed when we start working with it. So what I'm gonna do is, with those two layers selected, I'm gonna hit T to bring up our opacity settings. I'm just gonna set them both to 50%, and I can see where they are overlapping there. So for my left upper arm, we're obviously going to move the anchor point to the right here, essentially where the shoulder would be. And our forearm, we're just going to move the anchor point to the center of this overlap. And just test the rotation. You can see that mine's clipping ever so slightly there. So just move it slightly higher up. And uh, that makes it look as though the arm is actually attached correctly. So I'm happy with that. Let's quickly label both layer seven and layer eight in blue. All right, we can unsolo them there and we can bring their opacity from 50% back up to 100%. The torso, what we're gonna do is we're gonna move the torso's anchor point essentially sitting between the two pockets on this black zipper line. Just to, if we do want to sort of animate the, the rotation of that, we can then um, sort of make it look as though he's bending from the from the waist essentially even though the the jacket is covering down to the the pelvis that's kind of where his belly button would sit and i'm going to label that in purple then we have the collar layers so that's our collar front that one over there we're going to move the anchor point to that v-neck line over there we've got the head we're going to move the anchor point to that v-neck line as well and then layer 12, color back. We're not gonna move the anchor point because we won't be animating it at all. And I am going to set the color for layers 10, 11, and 12 also to green because they all refer obviously to the character's head. Coming down to layer 13, this is our pelvis. I'm also going to move the anchor point essentially to where that zipper is, kind of where the pubis bone would be at that angle that our character is standing at. And I'm gonna label that in purple as well so that I know that it relates to the central mass of the character, both torso and pelvis labeled in purple. Layer 14 and 15, we can solo those quickly. Those are our right arms, hitting T to bring up opacity, dropping that down to 50% and moving the anchor point for the right upper arm to where the shoulder would be and the forearm into the center of that overlap and just checking that it doesn't look as though it's disjointed, so that looks about right. And we can label both of these layers. I'm just gonna make them cyan. Hitting T, bring their opacity back up to 100%. All right, and then we'll do the same thing for the legs. So I'm gonna grab layers 16 and 17, quickly solo those. T for transparency, bring it down to 50%. And the upper leg, obviously move the anchor point to where the hip would be. And the bottom leg, where the knee would be, essentially at that overlap over there. And we can label both of these in fuchsia, nice bright pink. Layer 18 and 19 do the exact same thing. T for transparency, bring it down to 50% and move the anchor point for the upper leg to where the hip would sit and the lower leg anchor point to that overlap where the knee would be. All right. Now, you'll notice our character doesn't have any feet. We're I mean, just work, walking on little nubs today. That's because rotating and animating feet without a dedicated rig becomes an absolute nightmare. And uh, I think it's above and beyond what you guys are expected to do. So we're just going to have our little Powerpuff Girl kind of vibe going on here. Okay. Bring our opacity back up to 100%. And we now have, I need to do that for layer 16 and 17, just bring their opacity back up to 100%. All right. Now, something that we do just quickly need to correct, and I'm only noticing it now, um, our front leg is sitting a little bit higher than our back leg is, which typically it's the other way around, right? So we're just gonna drag the front leg down slightly and we can grab the back leg and just shift it up ever so slightly, just to create that illusion of foreshadowing where the, the leg that's closest to us is slightly longer than the leg that is furthest away from us. Okay. 
Then we have the half cycle image. We're going to be using this to help us pose our character today. We're not working with character reference footage. So we're going to use our cheat sheet to help break down what it is that we're doing. Um, I'm just going to label that in brown. And then we have a shadow layer. I've added this for those of you who want to play around with it. I'll show you how we do it at the end of the animation as well. So I'll label it in red to know that we're going to be animating it at the end along with the shades and the glasses. All right, and then obviously we have our background layer, which is just that dark background there. Okay, let's quickly get our parenting done and then I can show you how we're gonna go about doing this. So we've already parented layer one to layer five. So that's the shades matte. Please don't call it a matte, it's a matte. And uh, we're going to leave that there. So layer one is parented to layer five. Layer two, we're going to parent that to layer one. And we can turn the visibility for both layers one and two off because we're going to be dealing with them later. You'll see that they've already been set to shy. Then I'm going to grab layer three, four, five, and six. These all refer to the assets sort of located on our character's face. And I'm going to parent those to layer 11 which is our head layer. So layer three, four, five, and six parented to layer 11. Layer seven, our left upper arm is obviously going to be parented to layer nine, the torso. Layer eight, the left forearm is going to be parented to the left upper arm. So layer eight will be parented to layer seven. Layer nine, that is our torso. We are going to parent that to the pelvis. So layer nine will be parented to layer 13. Then we have layer 10, that's our collar front. I'm going to parent that to the head. So layer 10 will be parented to layer 11. Layer 11, our head layer will be parented to the torso. So layer 11 will be parented to layer nine. Layer 12 will be parented to layer 11. So that back collar will be parented to the head. Layer 13, the pelvis is not going to have a parent. Typically in our sort of limb chain or limb hierarchy, the pelvis is the, the sort of god parent. Nothing is, is parented, to, well, everything's kind of leading back to the pelvis, essentially, in our parent chains. So layer 13, we're gonna leave as it is. Layer 14, that's our right upper arm. We're going to parent that to layer nine, the torso. So layer 14 to layer nine. Layer 15 to layer 14. So that's the forearm to the upper arm. And then we have our legs. So layer 16 will be parented to layer 13. Top leg will be parented to the pelvis. Layer 17 will be parented to layer 16. So our bottom leg is parented to that top leg. Layer 18 will be parented to layer 13, the pelvis. And layer 19, that bottom leg will be parented to layer 18, leg top. All right, and that is it for the parenting. So the last two layers that we have here at the bottom is that shadow. I'm gonna make that shy and just turn off its visibility. So that's layer 21, just turn off the visibility and make it shy. And then layer 20 is our background image. We're gonna leave that as it is. Okay, now the next thing that we're going to do is we want to plan out our contact poses for a walk cycle. So basically we break down our walk cycle into a couple of poses here. And you can see these poses by clicking on this little footage tab at the top of your viewing panel. So you can see that if we break it down, a walk cycle takes place over one second. So that's 24, 25 frames. On our very first frame, we have contact. We then come down, up into a passing up and contact pose, and then repeat the cycle for the second leg. All right, so we're gonna be breaking this down into the bare bone basics as best we can. And what we're gonna to do to make this a lot easier for us is before we even begin animating, what we're gonna do is we're just going to use our little labeling function. Remember that we have this little comp marker bin here. And on each of these frames, we're just going to then create a label for each of these major points. So at the very beginning of my timeline here, and you'll see that as you try to move up and down the timeline, it's going to sort of bring you back into this view. So I actually kind of want to show you how we can go about creating multiple viewing panels in After Effects. So at the top of your viewing panel, you'll see that there is a little lock icon and then it says composition, cool cucumber walk cycle. 
That's the name of the composition that we're in at the moment. If you click on that blue text, you'll see that the first option says New Comp Viewer. I'm going to click on that. And what it does is it makes a second viewing window for me. Now you can see that it's got its rulers over here. So I'm just going to hit Command or Control R to get rid of those rulers. And essentially, this is just two different screens looking at the same footage. So it doesn't really help that, uh, that we're looking at that. So we're going to change what we're looking at. Now, at the top of our second viewing panel, you'll see that the lock icon is closed. So we're just going to click on that to unlock it. And we're going to then click on Comp 1 in our timeline. And you'll see that our view for both of these compositions now change. Okay. Coming back to our second viewing panel, I'm going to click the lock icon again. And essentially what this means is I've told After Effects that regardless of where I go, so if I click on my cool cucumber, that viewing panel will always show me the contents of that composition. It makes animating across compositions quite, quite a lot simpler. And it's also going to make setting up our markers a lot simpler. Okay, so now I can move up and down in my timeline and I still have my guide on screen. So at the start of my animation on zero frames, what we're going to do is we're just going to click and drag to create a marker. Remember that you can do that by clicking on this little bookmark looking icon and dragging it out to where your indicator is. I'm going to double click on that little icon that we've now just placed and I'm going to call this contact. Okay, then I'm going to move out to frame four as it says in my sort of view over here and I'll make a new point and this is our down pose onto frame seven make a marker and this is going to be passing position so I'm just going to say pass moving to frame 10 this is our upward motion so we're going to call it up and then frame 13, we get halfway through the cycle. This is where our contact pose now cycles. So we'll call that contact. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to just for the sake of reading out to you guys, we'll call this contact two. So we're going to just label them two from now on so that I can tell you where and when to copy paste keyframes later down the line. Moving to frame 16, this is going to be down two. Double click. So we type in down two and say, okay, move to frame 19. That is our passing position two. Frame 22, that is our up pose two. So I'll just call that up two. And then moving to the one second mark on frame 25, this is going to be our contact pose. So I'm gonna call that contact two. All right, so kind of because of the way After Effects works in terms of counting its frames, starting off on frame zero, we technically have one extra frame between the contact and the down pose here. So what I'm gonna do is at the very start of my timeline, I'm actually gonna just quickly move to frame one and I'm gonna move my marker there. I'm gonna hit B for beginning and that will then shorten my timeline to that length and I can right click on this gray bar. If you hover on it, it says work area and we're gonna select trim comp to work area. And that just guarantees that we now have the exact number of frames that we wanna work with. All right, so by placing these markers down, not only do we make it a lot easier to know where and when something needs to happen, but it makes it a lot easier animating individual layers. We don't have to keep referring back to guide layers anymore. We can refer back to these little markers. And I highly recommend that if you're like me and you kind of start getting overwhelmed when looking at animations that you want to try and practice recreating, break it down into its smaller pieces and put these little markers there. It makes life that much simpler. Okay. Now we're done with our second viewing panel. We've used it as best we can. We're going to leave it here so that we can refer back to it because when we're doing a walk cycle, it becomes very easy to get confused between which legs we're working with. From this angle, they've overlapped and I've tried to darken the one sort of darker than the other to make it easier to see, but it can become very easy to get confused. So rather than clo closing this panel, which you can do by clicking on those little burger stack icon there and click close panel, I'm simply gonna click and drag to just move it out the way for now. Okay, 
Cool. So we've placed our markers down and we've parented and rigged our character. So essentially we are ready to start animating. Now what we're going to do is we're going to be doing this literally step by step. No pun intended. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hide all of my layers except for the pelvis and layer 20, which is my sort of guide background image here. Okay. And what we're going to be doing with this is we're literally just going to get the motion of the torso moving up and down first. And then we have a guide for how to position the legs once we begin animating those. All right. So on our contact pose with layer 13 uh, selected, I'm just going to hit P for position and I'm going to create my first keyframe. All right. We can leave it where it is and we can then move on to the down position. And what I'm going to do is hold down shift and I'm going to hit down twice. Okay, so we're going to really over exaggerate the sink on that step. And that's just going to help us work with our legs a little bit more as well. Our legs are a little bit more stumpy, not necessarily as proportional as our reference guide here. Okay, so taking a look at the sort of oscillation that we have in the movement of our hips, moving to the passing position, our third position keyframe, I'm literally just going to put it back where it was. And then without holding shift, or rather while holding shift, I'm going to hit up just once. Okay, so for my third position, it was in line, so I could simply copy and paste my first keyframe to get it where I wanted it to be. And then holding down shift and hitting up once, so that our hips raise slightly higher than our starting point for that passing position. Moving to the up position, I'm going to hold down shift and hit up again. All right, so now we've got the same level of movement upwards that we do downwards on that sinking motion there. Okay, and then we have contact. Now, this is going to be quite nice and simple because we've already done those keys. We've got contact, uh, contact down, pass, and up one. I'm just going to select, copy, and paste them and place them in line with contact two, down two, pass two, up to and then ending on our final contact i'm just going to copy and paste the first keyframe again all right we're gonna oops sorry i pulled my earphone out there um we're going to be copying and pasting a lot of keyframes today we like to work smart not hard and if we can make our lives a lot easier in the process then all the better for it okay so playing that back we now have the bob motion that our torso is going to be following Obviously, if I turned on the rest of my layers, our character would kind of just be bobbing up and down in place at a rave, but we're going to turn that into a nice, believable piece of animation. All right. So still only with the torso in, uh, visible, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to grab layer 16 and 17. That is our front leg, and I'm going to turn their visibility on. Now, we don't need to have all of our layers visible here, so we can turn all of our other layers shy. I'm going to leave the pelvis where it is, uh, so we won't make layer 13 shy, but pretty much every other layer going all the way down, make those shy so that we only have layer 13, 16, and 17 on screen. And move our position to the, or our time indicator rather, to the start of our animation. Okay, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to hit Control or Command R to bring up rulers. All right, we remember working with rulers in our first term. We're going to click and drag, and we're going to place an icon for the floor. Now we're going to adjust this position in a moment once we pose our legs, but it's very important that we remember to place a visual indicator for where the floor is because the sort of easiest way to break the illusion of a walk cycle is to make it look as though the foot's not landing on the same surface in, in inverted commas every time it takes a step. So I'm just going to place that ruler there for now. I'll hit Command or Control R to get rid of it again, and we can then start posing our character. All right. So if I take a look at my contact pose, in fact, if I just quickly unshy, let's bring layer 20 and make that unshy as well. And then that way I can actually move this and use it as a guide, kind of like that. Okay, so with this now in place, I'm going to grab layer 16. That's our front upper leg. Um, and I'm going to hit 
P for position, holding down shift, R for rotation. Remember, holding down shift allows you to add or remove um, properties or values to your layer selection. And we're going to create a keyframe for position and rotation for layer 16. And then for layer 17, we're only going to hit rotation. If you think about how a leg works, we only bend at the knee. We can't sort of suck our knee higher and lower down our leg, thankfully. It'd be a little bit strange if we could. So we only need the rotation for layer 17. All right. And what we want to do now is we simply just want to pose it. So I'm going to grab layer 16 and I'm going to hit W on my keyboard. That gives me my rotation tool. It can be found immediately to the left of the pan behind tool. And that lets me pose my leg like so. So I'm going to just stick it out like that. And we're going to introduce a slight bend in the knee. I don't know if you guys have ever had like a dog or a kid run into your leg while you were standing with your knees sort of locked in straight. It really fucking hurts. It's not something that we do naturally locking our legs in a straight fashion. So there's always going to be a little bit of a bend there. All right. And now that we have our position, I'm just going to hit V to go up my selection tool. And I'm going to move the ground indicator, that ruler line that we have now placed. So I can mark where that's going to be. All right, and we now have our first pose. Moving into our down position, so just moving over to the first down point, you can see that because our torso has now moved down, we need to animate our leg to increase the bend in that um, contact pose, or that down pose, rather. So I'm going to hit W again, select layer 16, and I'm going to rotate it higher out. And I'm going to do what I can to get that leg looking roughly there. And we are also going to be animating the position of that leg. So we're just going to shift it up slightly, just so that the base of the foot is sitting pretty much parallel with that ruler line. All right. And what that does is it creates the illusion of the leg bending as we come down into that pose. Okay. Then making life simple, I'm just going to grab layer 20 and I'm going to shift it along to the right or sorry, to the left, just by holding down shift and using my left arrow key. And we're going to be making our passing pose next. Okay. So passing pose, this is where the entire weight of the body is standing on a single leg. So I'm going to grab my top leg here, quickly rotate it so that it's pretty much facing straight down. Do the same for the bottom leg with a little bit of bend in the knee. And we are going to shift that to the left. Right, so essentially by moving it over to the left, what we're doing is we're creating the illusion of that um, sort of rotation in the hip, that rolling movement that we have and I can bring its position down until it is touching that floor. So it looks as though it is extending nicely there, moving into that upward motion. Okay, then we have the up pose. It looks like we've moved the torso slightly too high. We might need to make a little bit of an adjustment there. Like I said, we've got pretty stumpy legs on our character. But I'm gonna shift this further to the left and we are going to further rotate that upper leg like so and straighten out our leg. Now, obviously we have moved this too high. We can't sort of create the illusion of our character skipping at this point. So I'm just going to shift the position of that torso down slightly and I'm gonna hit Command or Control C to copy my current up position and I'm gonna go and overwrite the key for up two just so that it moves the same height there and we can grab this upper leg and bring it down as far as we can. And that's fine. We can always readjust these positions as we need to. So I'll bring the torso even lower down. Command C. Let's go back to that other up two and paste my key there. So it looks like that leg is now passing over. Okay. And then we move into contact two. Contact two is where we come to the halfway point between our cycle. So essentially all we now need to do is I'm going to rotate this bottom leg out slightly and we can rotate the top leg out 
just a little bit as well. And it creates that nice bend there. Okay, so it kind of looks as though we've got this weird one-legged spider kind of just crawling along the floor at the moment. Cool. Then what we're going to do is we obviously need to now complete the cycle. A mistake that a lot of people make when doing this exercise is that they only look at this image and then they do half of a step. Remember, a walk cycle consists of two full steps. Okay, so simply referring back to our full point image over here, we can see what it is that we need to do with the legs next. So coming into the downward position, again, it really helps that we've placed the point for the floor. And over here, what I'm going to do is I need to come back to contact too quickly and just place a position keyframe. So remember, we can do that by clicking on that little empty keyframe button here. And then for our downward motion, we are going to hold down shift and just move the leg up into the bum slightly, maybe a little bit further to the left. And we can rotate the knee and the hip ever so slightly so that it's coming down into that step there. Okay, so that is for down two. Moving into the next passing position, if we bring ourselves here. In this passing position, our leg is now going to be, again, kind of in the center of the pelvis, but it is in the process of being bent out. So we're just gonna leave it like that, maybe bend it forward slightly. This is where our other leg is uh, having all of its weight on it. So we'll be doing that with our second leg movement there. So that comes up. For the up pose, we're going to move this to the right. Move our knee down slightly, like so. That creates the illusion that it's following forward. And then our contact pose, we've already done because we start and stop on our first frames. So I'm going to copy and paste the very first position in rotation keyframes for both of my layers. And that straightens out my leg. If you hit spacebar, we now have our initial movement. All right, looking pretty cool. Now, what we need to do next is we need to obviously animate the back leg. So I'm just going to quickly bring up my shy layers again. We're going to leave layer 16 and 17 visible. Let's quickly unshy and turn on the visibility for layer 18 and 19. And again, what we're going to do is I'm just going to grab layer 20 and I'm going to move it and just align myself so I can kind of get that initial frame over there. Grabbing layer 18, I'm going to hit P for position, R for rotation, and I'm going to create keyframes for both. And then layer 19, I'm going to just hit R for rotation and create my first keyframe there. All right, so we need to pose this correctly. We're going to grab layer 18 and quickly add a little bit of rotation there and rotate that leg out. And we can bring that leg down if we need to just so that we're making sure to stay in contact with that floor. All right, now the thing is, what we're doing to one leg is naturally happening to the other leg, right? It's a, it's a very sort of fluid, continuous motion. So what we can actually do is we can get away with a little bit of cheeky copying and pasting here rather than continuously reposing the leg. We might need to go back and refine it slightly, but we can get the big movements down. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come to the down point. So this is down one. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the keyframes for layer 16 in line with the down two marker that we've made. I'm going to copy those keys, reselect layer 18 and create blank keyframes for both position and rotation. And with those keys selected, I am going to paste the keys that I've copied from layer 16. I'm going to do the same. So I'm going to copy the rotation keyframe for layer 17 from the down two pose, make a blank rotation keyframe on layer 19 for down one and copy paste. All right. So hopefully you can see what we're doing here. We're going to move to pass one and we're going to copy the keyframes from pass two for layer 16 and 17 and paste it on layer 18 and 19. 
Okay, so I'm going to select the position rotation keyframes for layer 16 in line with pass 2. Command or control C. Create blank keyframes for layer 18's properties and hit command or control V. Grab the rotation keyframe for layer 17 from pass 2. Copy it there. Make a blank keyframe on layer 19 and paste it. And we're starting to build up that second leg. Moving under up one, I'm going to take the keyframes for up two, layer 16 and layer 17, and copy and paste them onto layers 18 and 19. And again, you can see now where having these labels really helps in this entire process. So now we're in contact two. What we're going to do is now we're going to start copying the contact down, pass, and up one keyframes and placing them in line with the two markers. All right, so for contact two, what I'm going to do is copy and paste the very first set of keyframes from layer 16 and layer 17 and paste them on layer 18 and layer 19. Moving to the down two position, I'm going to copy the keyframes from down one and paste them underneath down two. Moving to pass two, we're going to take the keyframes from pass one and continue to do the same. So hopefully you have now picked up on the pattern that is unfolding here. It's essentially just a very complicated offset. But because we've got our markers, copying now from up one and pasting under up two, we know what to take, we know where to put them. And then lastly, under the final contact pose, we are going to copy and paste the very first set of keyframes from layer 18 and the very first rotation keyframe from layer 19. And that brings our leg back to rest. And we now have a pretty vigorous walk, or at least the legs are walking. We obviously now need to do the arms. But this is kind of the hardest part. Once we've got the legs down, once we've got the torso moving, it's very easy to judge and gauge the timing of everything else that we need to do. Okay, so with that done, I recommend that you save your work. We don't want to risk it crashing halfway through. And we're going to uh, select all of our layers here, layer 13 down to 19, collapse them. And we're going to make them shy as well, because we no longer need them anymore. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn on layer 9, the torso. I'll remove the shyness from that. And then we're going to grab layer seven and eight, unshy those, turn their visibility on. So that's our upper arm. And then layer 14 and 15, that is our back arm. We'll just unshy those. Okay. And if we take a look, kind of looks like we've got a little dance going on. I quite like it. All right. So what we're going to do now is we just quickly want to pose our arms. So I'm going to select layer 9 and hit T to bring up its opacity. And I'm going to drop this down to maybe about 45% so that I can see through the torso so that I can then pose my arms correctly. We're going to be doing layer 14 and 15 last. That's actually going to be the easiest part of the animation because we don't see the arm for a large part of the animation. So we only need to do some very small keying there. We'll work with layer seven and layer eight first. So layer seven, I'm gonna hit P for position, hold down shift and hit R for rotation. Create my very first keyframes there. And then layer eight, R for rotation, create a keyframe. The torso, we are actually going to add a little bit of animation to that as well. So I'm just going to quickly hit P for position and create a position keyframe for layer nine as well. And this is just going to allow us to create a little bit of overlap when we offset the keys slightly. Okay, so uh, let's quickly pose our upper arm. We'll deal with the, the position keys for layer nine in a moment. So we're just going to rotate our arm to roughly get the same pose. And because this is our contact point, the shoulders kind of moved slightly over to the right. And that's because it's going to be rolling back to the left as our character comes down into this down position. Okay, so we kind of want a more neutral pose for our contact pose. Okay, 
Moving to down one, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to shift the arm slightly to the left, rotate it out a little bit further, and rotate that forearm out. Again, don't straighten it. We know naturally that if you sort of like snap your arm into that straight position, it really feels uncomfortable, it hurts. And it's something that we in hum as human beings can pick up on very easily if we're watching an animation. Um, reason being is obviously, if vast majority of us learn how to walk at a very young age and continue to do so for the rest of our lives. We don't think about it cognitively, but if you've ever noticed someone with a limp or noticed someone who's drunk, you, you pick up on that sort of change in their gait or that difference in their gait very quickly, right? We naturally understand how a body is supposed to move and we can identify when it's not moving correctly. So we don't want to snap that elbow because it's going to look a little bit strange. Okay. Moving over to the passing position, what I can do is just grab layer 20 and shift it over to the right so that I can continue to referring to it. And what I'm going to do is I am going to grab layer seven. I'm gonna rotate it out slightly further, not too much further, but you know, a little bit of a, a little bit more of a change there, just so that there's a bit of a difference between layer, um, between the down and the pass. We also want to make a blank position keyframe. Even though we didn't move the position, if I didn't place a position keyframe here, when I move to here, we're gonna have a strange floating effect. So we're now in line with our up position. If we take a look at this point, this is where our shoulder is now sort of rotating forward. So I've held down shift and hit the right arrow key once. And I'll adjust the rotation to be further in line so I'm even now getting confused between my poses, sorry. Um, I wanna just quickly take a couple of steps back. I'm gonna delete these keys. We're still on the passing pose. This is our passing position here. We want to move the arm slightly to the right so that it's rolled across the torso and we're gonna straighten out the arm slightly like that. Okay, so that's our third set. Now placed our position there. Grabbing layer 20 to shift it over so that I don't get confused again. I can refer to my up position. And we're gonna move over to our up marker. I'm gonna grab my left arm and hit right, uh, holding down shift and hit the right arrow key once again to roll it even further across the body. Add a little bit more of a rotation there, a little bit more of a rotation there. And then finally coming into contact to this is where the arms move the furthest across the torso and is rotating the furthest out away from the body. Okay, so we now have the illusion of that arm swaying to the right as well. Okay. Then what we're going to do is because the arm is essentially just going to now move back in the direction that it came from, what I can sort of, what I figured out we can get away with is if we copy now the, um, I'm in line with down two, and if I take the keyframes from up one, copy and paste those on our layers, it essentially then brings these back. So pass one to pass two, down one to up two, and then we end on the very first set of keyframes again. Okay, and we've got a slight bob going on the, on the arm there, and that's because we've, or I'm not happy rather with um, how we've set up this up position. So I think I just need to go to where up two is, and I want to just decrease the amount of rotation there slightly so that it's not as intense. Okay, and we can always then adjust and fix up the little glitches along the way when we need to at the end, when we start refining that animation. But for the most part, we've got good motion in the arms. Okay, um, I just wanna see how we could go about quickly fixing that. It's the position of it as well. So I'm just gonna go to up two, um, and I'm just gonna shift the position of the arm keys so that's for both down one and up two that I've now shifted slightly over to the right. And that just means we don't have that like glitching backwards movement there. That was a mistake on my part. Okay. 
Now we need to do the other arm. So we're going to now go back to the very beginning of our timeline. I'm going to grab layer 20 and just reposition it so that I can refer to that pose. Selecting layer 14 and 15, turning on their visibility, R for rotation for both layers and layer 14 will also have a bit of position. Create a position keyframe for layer 14 there as well. And we're just going to quickly pose this arm kind of like what we're seeing in the image here. All right, now we can't copy and paste the position keyframes for the arms or the rotation keyframes for the arms because they're rotating on different axes because of the way that they were made in Illustrator. So we can't use the same leg trick that we did where we just copy and paste those keys. But thankfully, the entire process is fairly simple. All we're actually going to do is just move out to where, if I quickly grab my uh, reference image, we're just going to move to contact two and we're just going to move the position for our front upper, uh, sorry, our back upper arm to the right a bit. And we'll adjust its rotation so that it is in the opposite direction there. And the right forearm can then rotate further out as well. Let me shift that across. And that's just going to create the illusion of that arm rotating out. Coming back to contact two at the very end of our timeline, we'll copy and paste our very first set of keyframes for layer 14 and layer 15. And that creates the illusion of the back arm swaying. Okay. And I mean, if we think about it, we might not necessarily even need these keyframes for the down pass and up. So I didn't think of trying this, but if I delete these keys quickly, perhaps I've made you do them all for nothing. Uh, it still works, but there is something nice being able to have that level of um, sort of control over it. So I think I'm going to leave those keyframes there for now. And I'll fiddle around with them once we start refining our motion. Okay, so we have now animated pretty much everything. All we need now is the torso. I'm going to hit T to bring up its opacity and bring that back up to 100%. And then P to bring up my position over here. Um, where we've created our first keyframe. And all I'm going to do is where we go for our down pose, I'm just going to, without holding down shift, I'm going to use my down arrow key one, two, three times. For the pass, I'm going to go one, two, three, four up. For the up pose, I'll just hit up twice. And then I can copy and paste these keys. So from contact, down, up. And lastly, copy and paste the very first contact pose there. And what this does is we've added some extra movement now to the torso that we can offset and create a nice little bit of movement there. Okay, so it looks pretty cool so far. I hope that you guys can agree. What we're going to do now is let's quickly unshy all of our layers and we're going to bring up, just make everything visible at this point. And we're going to hide our layer 20 and see what our character currently looks like. Oh, hey, looks like a pickle on a mission, man. So this is now the basics of our movement. What we're going to do is just quickly hit Command or Control A to select all of our layers and hit U for uniform to bring up our keyframes. All right, I'm going to drag and select all of these and I'm going to hit F9 to apply easing. We're not going to dive into the graph editor today because we're not working with a reference and I do not have the mental capacity or the skill actually to come up with a sort of dedicated gate out of my head. I too need reference for that. So when it comes to your own reference recording, you might find that you need to adjust the graph editor slightly to get the timing right. But for now, we've got our bog standard walk. Okay. Taking a look at our arms, I'm still not happy with the way that that like arm there is kind of glitching a little bit. So I do want to see if I just take my um, set of keyframes here. I'm going to delete them, not for the torso, uh, just for layers seven and eight. Delete the down pass and up keys, down two, down, uh, pass two and up keys there. So the arms are just moving at the same rate now. And that looks a lot better, sorry. It's always good to do the extra work and find out you don't need it than the other way around. Okay, so we now have the basics of our motion. What we're going to do is just quickly offset a couple of our keyframes here. 
So what I want to do is I'm going to grab the key frames for layers nine, that's our torso, shift them to the right by one. If I play that back, we have a little bit more of like a nice bouncy feel to it. And um, because of the sort of synchronicity of the walk, that's really all we need to offset. We're not going to offset the legs or the arms. They're moving in tandem at the sort of natural rhythm that they would need to. So I'm going to hit Command or Control A to select all my layers again. Oops, I hit the wrong keys there. Just quickly reset my timeline and we're just going to collapse those layers. Okay, so now what I want to introduce you to is we're just going to make it look as though while our character is walking, we have these light sort of sheens gliding over his sunglasses. And in order to do that, I'm going to be introducing you to two slightly more complicated or next level sort of tools in After Effects known as masks and mats. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to grab layer three all the way down to layer 21, make all of those layers shy, and then unshy layer one and two. These are the only layers that I want to be dealing with. We only want layer one and two on screen for now. Now, layer one is a duplicate of layer five. So if I sort of move layer one out the way, you'll see that we've got two sunglasses and we've parented our sheen to the top pair of sunglasses. Okay, so I find it difficult to explain what mats and masks are if I'm not actually sort of talking to you guys in person, but I'm gonna try my best. Essentially, when we work with a mat and when we start working with masks, we're starting to tell After Effects how to go about revealing certain pieces of information. So first off, what we're gonna do is we are going to grab layer one, and I'm going to then select the pen tool. Now, what happens is when we have a layer selected and then we select either the pen tool or the shape tool, what happens is we are about to make a mask. And you can tell that um, After Effects is, is prepared to make a mask when you see the pen icon with that little white square and the black circle in the middle. It means that we are going to be cutting out information essentially. So what I'm gonna do is with my pen tool, I'm just gonna click to create a point, click to create a second point, click to create a third point, click to create a fourth point, and then I need to close the shape by clicking on my very first point over there. And uh, if I just quickly hide layer five, you'll see that that mask is now only revealing that portion of the layer one that we have selected. So by default, when we apply a mask to a layer, it sets it up so that it shows you the information inside that layer. Now to access your masks, you can select your layer and hit M, M for masks, and that will then show you that you've got one mask path that has been made. And it has a little drop down toggle option that says add. Clicking on that and selecting subtract will then hide what's inside my selection and only show what's outside of that selection. Okay, I'm then going to reselect my layer and we're gonna mask out the little sticky between the two actual lenses. If you sort of think about how light reflects off of sunglasses, it's not gonna be reflecting off of the, the arm of the glasses or that little middle bridge section. So you can have multiple mask layers on a single layer. You can see that we now have mask two. We're gonna change this drop down from add to subtract, and now it's only showing those two lenses over there. Okay, once that's done, you can collapse layer one. We are pretty much finished with that layer for now. Then we're gonna select layer two, the glasses sheen, and we wanna just hit V for our selection tool. We're not gonna be masking out this shape, but we wanna make it look as though these lines are glossing over those lenses over there. And in order to do that, we only want them to be visible when they overlap with that visual information. This is why we have a duplicate of the glasses. Essentially, layer one is acting as a representation for the lenses. And if we turn layer five back on, that's just the normal glasses underneath. Okay, so with layer two selected, at the bottom of your timeline, there is a button that says toggle, switches, and modes. Clicking on that, it will then say mode. We're gonna leave those both as normal. 
And then there's an option for track mat, that T-R-K-M-A-T there stands for track mat. And you'll see that there is currently an option that says none. I'm going to click that little option and we're going to say very first option here, alpha mat shades mat. So alpha mat and then the name of the layer. We're going to click and boof, our information has disappeared. Where is it? Well, it's now only visible when it is overlapping with the visual information of those glasses layers that we have made. So from this shade layer here. All right. So what we're going to do now is we're just going to leave these where they initially were, hit P for position and create a keyframe. Then I'm going to go to the very end of my timeline and I'm just going to drag it across and place it in line with my character's ears. And that way it animates sliding along the glasses as our character loops back and forth. All right, we go into a lot more detail with mats and masks next term. It's um, kind of once we start getting into mats and masks is where we really start getting into being able to do really cool pieces of animation. But for now, this is just a basic introduction. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to hit W and I'm actually going to rotate this shape a little bit over here just so it's a little bit more angled. And when you zoom out and play this back, because we have that information sliding along, it doesn't look like our character is just hopping in place. It now actually looks as though he's moving. Okay, so hopefully you think that that is pretty cool. Next up, what we're going to do is I'm just going to unshy these and we'll leave all of our layers here. And I'm going to grab layer 21, the shadow, turn its visibility on. Click the toggle switches and mode so that I can access my shy functions again. And I'm just going to make everything shy except the shadow. Everything shy except the shadow. Well, I'll try saying that fast a couple of times. And now we're only dealing with our shadow layer. Okay, so with our shadow layer, what we can do is uh, we can actually just click and drag to remove that little marker there for the floor. And I'm going to kind of try and place this just below my character. Okay, now the shadow itself might need a little bit of finessing, but the best way that we can go about animating it is we're going to hit P for position, holding down shift and hitting T to bring up its opacity, and we're going to make our first keyframes here. Okay, I'm going to move to the passing position. This is technically where our shadow would be its smallest if we're kind of trying to sell that visual illusion. And, um, oh, sorry, sorry, we're not doing position, we are doing... Uh, scale. So I'm just going to remove my position keyframe. I'm going to hold down shift and hit P to get rid of that property and then holding down shift and S to add scale. Let me create a keyframe and just drop it there at the beginning. All right. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So then what we're going to do is at the passing point, I'm going to drop my opacity down to maybe about 10%. We don't want there to be too big a discrepancy between the two. And we're just going to bring the scale of our shadow down slightly as well. And that just looks as though that as our character is stepping off of it, that shadow is scaling accordingly. Coming back to contact, I'm just going to copy the very first set of keyframes and paste it there. And then for our passing, I'll just copy the keyframes from pass one to pass two. And then the very first set of keyframes at the end of our contact pose. And this just creates a little bit of a illusion there that our shadow is reacting to our character as he sort of comes down closer to the ground and then moves further away from it. All right. And that is that for our um, walk cycle. I'll just slap some easing on here so that it's kind of easing at the same rate as our character's steps. And there we go. We have our first piece of animation. All right. So I hope that uh, you guys didn't get too lost along the way. If you did, by all means, drop me an email, get in touch. Either myself or Yaku are always here to help you guys out. Um, in terms of homework, what I would like you guys to do, please, is I will make sure to sort of give very clear instructions for the, the tasks and deadlines. But I want you guys to record a walk cycle reference footage for next week. So the exact same process that you did for your force and weight. Um, I'd recommend that you get someone to help you. They need to essentially just film you as you walk across the screen. Or you can set up your camera on a tripod and then literally just walk 
you know, in front of the camera side on so that you uh, capture yourself walking sort of through that scene and you can use that as reference. Now, in the past, I sort of encouraged a lot of people to try and do like weird or silly or funny walks, but that was back when I was able to be in the classroom to help you with technical errors and to help you with issues along the way. Unfortunately, one of the side effects of this entire COVID bullshit thing is that I've had to dumb down the content as much as I can just so that I don't lose anybody along the way. So if you want to challenge yourself, I recommend that you do then do that. Do a little silly walk, maybe a bit of a like a gangster limp or whatever it is that you want to do. But if you just want to do the animation, simply record yourself walking at your normal pace and um, moving across the screen in that sort of session. It's very important, and I'll make sure that it's part of the instructions. You need to take at least two full steps in your reference footage. All right, preferably three or four, because that way you can always then choose which part of that cycle you want to use best. Don't just take a single step and call that reference footage. Not good enough. Walk across the screen at least two steps in view of the camera so that you can use that as reference footage. All right. Next week in class, we're then going to start working on your own walk cycle animation. So we can then begin there. Get your reference footage up as quickly as possible so I can give you yes or no. And then you don't have to record that at the beginning of our lesson next week. Okay, try and avoid having to do that. All right. I hope that I've covered everything that you guys have needed along the way. If you guys get stuck or lost, drop me an email. Otherwise, good luck for the rest of the week. And I'll catch you guys on the flip side. Ciao.